movie about what you're doing. And he said, if you want to do that, he said, research this. Research this. Come with me. And that was seven years ago. So here we are, and now it's time to make that movie. And I've had a ton of experience working with him, meeting people. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited. I just did an interview today. And uh, I just all I can say is all glory to God. God is just uh, all over this film. And when it's done, it's going to expose the dark side of what's going on, of uh, the things that Russ talks about. But it's also going to reveal the answer, the truth, the gospel, how to battle it, and a wake-up call to the church. So that's that. But if uh, anybody is interested about what I'm doing, you can look it up online. The name of the website is detestablefilm.com. And we cover your prayers and anything, uh, you know, any questions or anything like that. So, but appreciate that. Appreciate this man so much. He just came along, uh, you know, years ago, and I had questions, and he said, come with me, come with me. And he took me to New York, he took me to Germany. Took, I've been more places with him than I have with my wife. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And she's not jealous. She's not jealous, and she's very supportive, and she lets me go. And my life was so boring before I met him. <laughs> Exciting, but I'll tell you, I read a lot of books on this subject and do a lot of research. But in my opinion, this man is the best teacher. He has a gift for communicating God's word, and you guys are getting a treat today. So, um, you know, God bless Russ Dizdar. So glad everybody made it out. And uh, you ready to go? I'm ready to go, okay. man. Okay. Okay. Now. When when he said location, he meant locations. Even though I've been every, he'd been everywhere. He meant like locations, Germany, right? That was really good, Tom. I want to take you to Russia now. We have three sites: uh, Croatia, Russia, and uh, Belgium. Belly of the Beast, the Mother of Darkness Castle. So um, that's one of the uh, things. I have uh, something I want to bring to you today that is. Uh, Connected to all of what we're talking about. This little guy doesn't want to come up here. Nope, I don't want that. Um, anybody want to throw out one question while I'm playing with this and arguing with this thing? Could be. Could be, um, and when I say that it could be, because there's there's different levels of um, different levels. Well, you'll see in the notebook that we're going to go through: oppression, possession, attachment, um, piggyback. What we call piggybacking. To I'm, I'm look, I heard a voice, but who am I talking to? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it, it, there's a number of factors. You know, if it's not physiological and foods and things like that and other things, it's been a problem. Uh, you got to, you know, sometimes take a look at that. If it, it was, if it's a behavioral thing issue that just occurred and there was, you know, no curbing, no direction or whatever, uh, and then it depends on what they embrace. If it involves demonization in some level because they've opened the door in some level, demons always cause trouble. Okay, they do, and they can alter. Sure. Yeah. Well, in inner healing issues, and we'll touch on this today, Psalm 139, I, you know, search me, Lord, and see if there's any offensive thing. That's true in the area of healing, too, because if you have wounded traumas, things like that, bitternesses, anger, things that are here that can open a door for the enemy to make that even worse, uh, we call that an attachment, um, then whatever they call it, what needs to happen is get down to the source of it, whether that's a issue of woundedness, some kind of issue that where the enemy even makes a real sense of anger, defiance. What does Ephesians 6, uh, 426 down say? Be angry, but don't send all the sun on your anger and give the devil a foothold. Foothold, topos, a legal right to grab a hold of an area. A lot of people with trauma, beach ball trauma down, put down when they were kids because they didn't know what to do with it. They keep the trauma way pushed down with all of the, it's like we call it toxic, 
toxic uh, beach ball of, of stuff down there. Well, demons love that stuff, and so they can at least ha attach and make it worse. Until there's deliverance and healing, that can affect the whole emotional, willful, mental state of an individual. And we're going to talk about that tonight. One more question, then we got this. Yes. Rise, the rise of the dark side. Um, the rise of the dark side's presence in the world matches the suppression and quieting and compromise of the church. Not that it should, but among, like I, when I first got saved, I was a Buddhist. I got saved. I went to the Assembly of God. I went to Southern Baptist. I went to many others along the way. Um, but I don't care if it's Pentecost, because people always ask me, where can I go to church? What about, a, I don't denominate, I don't even, I, you know, I, I, I'm all, we're coming out with a thing to say, here's the, here's the f top 10 greatest factors of a local church, um, and this is what you look for, because I can't even go by names any longer, I just can't. Um, all the new movements, all the independents, and whatever. We've been to a number of good places, but let me just say this. I believe with the rise of the dark side's presence in cities. How many of you feel their cities got darkness over the city? I don't know if we'll get to it today, but that's related to um, dark side coven rituals within your city in the last 30 years and the rise of uh, manifesting powers in your city. So with the rise of the dark side, if you remember, the, here's a quick story, and we're going to get to this over here. Uh, Moses in the Old Testament, you know, had his arms up for intercession and prayer, you know, prayer, right? And Israel uh, was defeating a demonized, cult-oriented, they would have called them their own gods, did human sacrifice nation. When the prayers of intercession went down, what happened? They began to win. It's laws of engagement. It works the same on that side of the fence. If they're summoning and sending powers, and if they're growing in numbers, if they're doing more of it, if there's more of it in a city, I have seven factors. It's called Dark Rituals, Dark Powers on my web website. It's all free, the, the little training series. If you feel your city's dark and so forth, there are seven factors you know, that, that relate to the possibility of real human sacrifice in the city because there's a design on their side to release spirits to dirty, they call it to dirty the air, to make the air... Um, present with dark side presence. I'll talk about that in a few moments when we go through some of this book. Um, but I'm saying that the suppression of the church is by design for the other side. It evidences the weakness of the church in its discipleship in spiritual warfare and the victories that we should have. Um, being a part of the old Pentecostalism and so forth, my wife was raised in the Pentecostal church from childhood up. Um, they were doing a number of things, but they were lacking in a lot of things, too. They were lacking a lot of things, too. And uh, just to say, well, Satan can't come in here because this is the body of Christ. Sorry. Jesus was in the room, and Satan came in and came after the disciples. So without the discernment, without the use of authority, without fake emotionalism, um, without all the armament that we need, any body of Christ that wants all the armament, everything that Jesus has today will become a powerful church. Any Christian that wants that today will become a powerful Christian. And that's what we're going to deal with in this next section when we, when we come to that too in, in answer. But I'm going to tell you this. 
with the, the last three decades with the rise of the other side. And you just saw a bunch of pictures, the rise of Satanism, the rise of Wicca, the rise of the New Age, the rise of the underground Satanism, the rise of, you know, drug-related rituals, rituals for the drug trade. The rise of all that has brought tens of millions of more demonic presence. And we're seeing it over the cities of the United States where people are saying it's dark. If you feel it's dark over your city, it can't be unless the laws of engagement. Somebody's doing something on the ground and has been. If you have one satanic, ritually abused person in, in Town Beach, you probably have three, you know, 30, 30, 30 or 40 more in other generations, which means there's a coven that knows how to summon and send, summon and transfer, and do all the things necessary in the creation of satanic, ritually abused, you know, that kind of person. And I'm telling you again, I'm, I'm trying to you know, maybe scream it out to you and say, because I, I give a grid on that course called Dark Rituals, Dark Powers, that if you want to find it in your city, if your city is dark, part of the other elements of the rise of the dark side in your city isn't just the suppression of the church, the rise of uncanny violence and rape, rise of deep-oriented drug issues in the city too, and the guarantee that you will find ritually abused people, which means the coven has been operating, and they've been summoning and sending and summoning and going. They operate in stealth. We won't even have time to do this in the uh, December 12th when we'll do this, uh, but we won't be able to do it here. Um, I'm just telling you how secretive, but yet how by design the other side works. They know who you are. The um, most powerful one that I ever dealt with years ago, an officer brought out of Pennsylvania to us. Um, we were talking one day, and they said, well, what do you know about spiritual warfare? And I said, well, what do you know about spiritual warfare? And they said, we have a grid map of Northeast Ohio. Every single church is listed. They're color-coded. And the ones, and I forget the color, the ones with this color cause us trouble. We will then target them in the summoning and sending of demons. And if that doesn't work, we'll send people in to begin a whole scenario. To divide the church. To weaken the church. To break down its prayers. We'll send a highly demonized multiple... How about PTL to bring down a leader? How about a woman that will be used to send in with sexually created subparts that are there to compromise and they're, they're, they're sent in by target? Think on that for a minute. Come out of here. Welcome, Mike. Hey, welcome, Mike. Just say hello to Mike. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold this because um, this, this rug does help. Um, let me just give a quick, quick, short background. Um, many, many years ago, I, we were out soul winning, evangelizing at a, at, a, at, a, at a bowling alley right down the street here. And uh, I met a young kid like this big, and he showed me his Kralinian deck of tarot cards, charge, and he's telling me all about this stairway coming, all the stuff you're trying to witness. So I didn't see him for quite a while, and I met some uh, girls that were, uh, well, I just, they were twin little girls. They wanted me to go after their brother and go witness to him. So they sent me to a bar. We met him in, uh, we met this guy, and in, in the, in the, in the, in, and he had an amulet around his neck. We began to engage him, and his eyes rolled back, and he almost went into full possession uh, manifestation. And he took off, went back into the bar. Uh, Mike's been on a prayer map, prayer list for a long, long time. His friend Jordan, listening to us on the radio, brings this guy that I hadn't seen for 15, 16, 17 years brings him to my house for a Bible study. <laughs> Let me just, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to just put this here. And you go I want you to hear a little bit about what we're talking about. Um, Jordan, you want to come up here? Everybody welcome Jordan. Uh, my name is Mike, like he said. Um, my mom is still, to this day, studies witchcraft. Um, I know she just studied um, Halloween. She did a spell for my sister. She studies. I mean, she's deep into the, to the occult. Always has been since before I can remember. Um, witchcraft's been a part of my life or, like I said, been brought into it by choice, not by choice, but was just there. 
kind of like when you're pick your kid up and say, hey, let's go to church. Your kid's refusing to go. Eventually, he wants to go. Same thing with me. Um, eventually, I wanted to learn because I've seen what it does. I've seen the power of it. Never knew the power of God or Jesus Christ or anything. Anything I've ever known growing up was covens, cults, hurting people. Um, was taught with my tarot cards for years that I could help people. And honestly, I thought if I read someone's tarot cards, and I was good. I was really good. Um, I was telling people their future, telling them, hey, you're going to have this baby, uh, you're going to have a little boy, or you're going to have a girl, and it's going to have blonde hair, blue eyes. Hey, I know, you're, I know things about you that you, no one knows, that you've hidden a closet. I could read your tarot cards and... It wasn't me doing it. It was the spirits and the demons and things I was in touch with that could tell me what was going on with the, that person. And for a long time, I thought I was, I thought I was good. I thought my mom used to tell me you can shouldn't walk in both both paths. Well, I believed if I was helping someone with my tarot cards and with witchcraft, I was okay. God liked me. I was doing good in my eyes, but. You can only follow one path. Either you go towards God's path with Jesus Christ, or you follow the other path. And the devil's biggest thing is to teach you in witchcraft that you're good. You know, God's not good. And the devil teaches you when you're studying witchcraft that uh, he deceives you. I mean, the biggest thing that the devil is going to do is tell you, like he told me, that you're doing good because you're helping people. Because I would tell someone, I told a sergeant of Canton Jail, hey, don't drive your car this weekend. You have a little girl, which was his niece at the time. I said, don't get in your car this weekend. I told him what kind of truck he drove, where he was going, how he was going. And I'm, in, I'm locked down. I'm in jail for whatever the reason was. And I told him, hey, don't, don't drive this weekend. And two, three hours later, you know, he comes pulls me out of my cell and says, hey, how'd you know I was going to drive this weekend? I'm like, I don't. They told me. And he didn't drive because he would have had his niece with him and he would have gotten a car wreck that weekend. He did wreck his car, and it was a pretty bad wreck, but the little girl that was supposed to be with him wasn't because I told him in jail that, hey, you know, you shouldn't do this. And I thought, hey, you know, I'm doing good. You know, witchcraft's great. And it's not. It, the covens I've been in, they teach you that you're doing good. And you're not doing good. I mean, I've, I've been in houses where demons are there. And up until Jordan, my good friend, prayed for me for years and worked with me. I mean, I never went to church. He'd brung me to Russ's and... There was times I wanted to beat him up. <laughs> like, literally, wanted to just whack him just because he was talking, you should do this. Or, and he was praying for me, and I'm like, oh, your prayers don't work on me. It's never going to work. And until the fact I met with Russ and down in his basement with my fiance, I was committed to witchcraft, 100%. I mean... We used to tell people in the coven I was in, if you don't believe in heaven, we'll show you hell. You want to see a demon? We'll show you. I have a good friend of mine, big guy, huge, strong, one of the strongest guys I've ever, ever met. We did a, um, a coven meeting probably 20 years ago, and we had a, a circle, and we had fire and a demon come out. And my friend, scared, scared to death of what we can do, and what my mom can do. I mean, my mom still recognizes her uh, witchcraft name is Abigail Wright. She's in connection with uh, the Sarahway Coven. Has been for years. A lot of, there, I mean, there's been deaths, that, deaths there of a little girl. I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, my best friend, well, not my best friend, but a good friend of mine, Danny Cooper's daughter, was sacrificed there with uh so i mean the stuff's real 
I mean, people think, oh, people ain't dying, but when it touches base with you, when you know, I knew the little girl, seen her. I was friends with Danny. I've known him for years. Our birthday's the same. Um, his daughter died there because of a coven. And God loves his children. I mean, nothing like we do. Like, I have a little girl and two boys at home. My fiance was pregnant. This is how I, I mean, when I started practicing, I started laying down my, my witchcraft for a while. And when I gave it up, I was at home by myself. I called Jordan the night I gave it up. I mean, I went to church with him that day, and I pretty much denounced the devil and the things I was so in touch with, things I thought I would carry an amulet with me. And if I was going to get in a fight, because I grew up in a rough life, and always fighting, physical fights, like or cursing people, I would call, I'd hold it, and I would change. Um, demonized, whatever I... I would call upon a spirit, a demon spirit, and it would come to me and it would take over. So I was scared of nothing, no one, no person, nothing. Because it wasn't me being scared, it was what I called upon to take control. Because I gave it complete control of my body, of my everything. And when I was at home one night after I gave up the witchcraft, and I, was, I even told my mom, Mom, I'm done, I can't, I'm not going to do it no more. And she's like, okay, well, that's your path, and, you know, I'm still staying on mine. And she didn't say, Mike, I don't want you out of the coven or whatever, and, which was great on her part, you know, she didn't try to keep me in it. She said, you know, you got to follow your own path, and she believes that. My path was, I've always thought I was doing good, and I with the witchcraft, I said, oh, if I do this, I can help people. If I read your tarot cards and I tell you you're going to get in a wreck, like I told the officer, and he didn't get in a wreck, and I, I figure I'm saving somebody. But it's all deceiving, and in a way, it's just twisted. Um, Jordan prayed for me. I went to met with Russ. Um, the night I gave up the witchcraft, like I was trying to get back to, uh, I heard a, heard a demon in my room. Like, as clear as I'm talking now, I heard it say, come back. It did not. They don't want you to leave. Once you're in there and you're in that world, you think they're not going to come to you. They're not going to hurt you. Well, once you stop doing what they want you to do, and they're using you. They're using you 100%. I was, I would give myself, I mean, there was times I would be at work. And I'd work through my lunch break because I would, this is a couple years ago, um, I would lose, I would lose thought. Like I could be talking, and all of a sudden, click. I wasn't there no more. Something else was, and I was not there. Jordan could testify. He, I mean, uh, uh, he was talking to me several, several times, and I would lose train of thought. I would say things or do things that I don't remember saying or doing. Um, did the same thing with my fiance. I mean, the witchcraft got bad. We, we separated for a while and honestly thought about going back to the witchcraft because Satan wants you. He put some things in her life that, you know, we separated temporarily. We worked things out. Uh, I thought about committing suicide. I went to Russ's house. He had a meeting, not this past one, but the one before that. And I told him, I said, Russ, I'm not here. I said, I'm here, but I'm not here. And we prayed about it. And... I said, I'm going to commit suicide. And it wasn't me that was saying it. I was telling, something in me was like, the demons was telling me, if we can't have you, no one can. And that's how I felt. Like, because I knew in my heart, because I could call my mom and say, mom, I need you. And she would come and she would do what I asked her to, because she's my mom. She loves me. And I could have went to the woods like I've done several times, and went back into my witchcraft mode, and I could have prayed, you know, I didn't think God would help me. I thought, you know, God took her away. It's my right to get her back. I'll get her back any way I want, any way I can. So I could have went to the woods and prayed and did a ritual, and I could have had Tiffany back. Well, 
I think a week's about the longest one of these rituals will last. And I could, you know, easily just got her back, but it's not right. It's manipulating free will. Yeah. And you can't do that. I mean, you can, but free will is always going to come back and bite you in the ass. No, sorry to cuss, but <laughs> it's going to. And it, they, the demons, they don't care. They don't love us. They, and the cults I've been in, coven I was in, that we were taught, you know, you know, secret things. I was in covens and stuff done to me before I could remember, like things I blocked out. Been in houses where there's been demons, there's been spirits, things moving around the room. Um, the devil wants us. I mean, he wants our kids. He wants, the demons want all of us. My fiance went, was pregnant with my daughter. She was pregnant with twins. And this recently after I stopped studying my witchcraft, it was still in my house. Like, I'd call my mom. And I'd be like, hey, mom, uh, you know, talk to her. But not so much as, I, I didn't believe the authority of God. I didn't think God had any authority because I've done open so many doors in my house and had a pentagram in my basement for years. I didn't think God had any, any authority to cast out what was a, I already summoned because in the Bible it says Satan's the God of the world, you know, God of this earth. And I figured, well, Satan's in charge now, so what power does God have? If I've done brung all these demons here, how can I get rid of them? And my mom would say, well, you got to do this spell to cast this demon out. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm just going to bring another one? <laughs> and then I got then you got, and you do. In witchcraft, you, you're taught protection spells. And you work a protection spell to get, to protect yourself from the demons. I mean, come on, people. I mean, the first thing you should have known if you've got to do a protection spell to keep yourself away from the demons, you should... Shouldn't be doing, you shouldn't be doing this to begin with, but that's what you're taught. You're taught how to keep the, the bad ones out and the, let the good ones in. Come on, there ain't, no, there ain't no good ones. The ones that don't look as ugly as the other ones, come on. You, I mean, even in the Bible, it talks about, like, Satan. People think Satan's this big, ugly, red demon. He's not. He's beautiful. He's never got it. Don't say anywhere in the Bible that Satan, when he was, when he was cast out of heaven... It don't say he changed forms. He was God's dude. I mean, like his partner. I mean, you know what I'm saying? The devil is gorgeous. He's not going to come back as a mean, ugly guy. He's going to come to you as a, a beautiful, if you, if, you, if you miss your grandma, he's going to come back to you as your grandma. If you miss your dad and his dad's passed away, he's going to come back as your dad has passed away. He's not going to come to you some big, mean creature because he's going to pull you in any way he can. Like, uh, how do I get free? You pray. And luckily, God will put people in your life, like Jordan, uh, Savior to me. He puts Jordan and touch me back with Russ. Um, he'll put people back in your life who's been praying for you for years, and you don't even know them. Like, Russ knew me. When I seen him in the bar, I didn't care. My sisters were crazy. Leave me be. I'm doing what I'm doing. I didn't care. I was happy doing what I was doing because it was who I was. And I surrounded my life around it. I had witchcraft pictures throughout my house. I kept rocks and charged objects everywhere. I didn't go anywhere without them because they were my protection. It's not like the protection of God where you don't need a charm or anything you can be butt naked running down the street and God's going to be with you. <laughs> you don't need a, char a charged tarot deck to tell you something's going wrong. God's going to work with you and tell you up front, you know. He's going to put it in your heart. Hey, you're doing the wrong thing. The Holy Spirit comes in and says, you're doing wrong. You're, you know when you're messing up. Yep. Like when you yell at your kid too much, if you, for the people that have kids, and you feel bad afterwards. You're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. That's not you saying that. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you know, you took it a little far. And look, we all do it. 
Um, like I said about the demons coming, I had a demon in my house. Uh, I asked my mom how to get rid of it. She told me, you know, they're there. Just leave them be. They'll, they won't mess with you. You don't mess with them. Okay, well, that's like having a stranger in your house you don't know, just walking around. Well, we had, my fiance was in, in our room. She, like I said, she was pregnant with twins. Uh, the demon appeared to her, to her and touched her stomach. Um, within, I think, the next two doctor visits we went to, they told us that we had lost one of the babies. It's not that we didn't lose it. I mean, the, she can clearly stand up and tell you. I mean, the demon stood in front of her and touched her belly. And, I don't know, two, three weeks later, we go to the doctors and we find out that the baby's gone. I mean, it's sad. That, but, I mean, I know I'll see boy, girl, whatever we would have had, I'll see it again. So the devil don't win. All he does is try to deceive us and change. Like, people think we die. No one dies. My grandpa used to tell us we just change form. Nothing ever dies, just changes form. So we can either choose to burn in hell or be in heaven glorious because we're not going to die. None of us. We're just going to go to a different place. Either you want to go here or you want to go here. And it's up to us to decide where we're going to go. And God don't want none of us going. To this. Hell was not designed for humans. It was designed for demons. It wasn't none of us, no matter good, bad, whatever, was never designed to go to hell. Man's not designed to go to hell. But the devil, lonely, I don't know, he wants us there. He's bored. <laughs> Listen, I want you to keep my mic in prayers because uh, this is uh, a lot of this is relatively new, and he did give up the amulet. He did give up the tarot card deck. Those have been marked for destruction, and um, he, there's a wealth. I mean, he was raised in all of it heavily, and uh, this is he scratched the surface of what he knows, what he's seen, and as he grows in the Lord, becomes powerful in the Lord, and as he gets involved in deliverance, we had a, a session at our house in which uh, there was demonic stuff, and he and again he gave the charged object up, and uh, he gave that old high-powered uh, tarot card our deck up and and that's part of what happens when we're coming to Christ and giving these things up these have to be renounced we're going to see that in the training here too but in just turning to the Lord you know we've seen we got to see in the last couple of weeks just God beginning to work in his life and in his family what God's going to do you know I, I think about this you know the thing with the demon and the touching of the child well that was generational issues or whatever else it might have been a uh, punishment issue all I know is they ultimately uh, bring into destruction Jesus comes you know to give life Satan comes to kill, still destroy, and Jesus comes to give life, and life more abundantly, and so that's what we, we wanted to see that, and that just radiance of Christ to come through Mike's life, and he's, I'm, I've, I've been looking at him, and just like, you know what, you're going to be very powerful in soul winning, and in ministering to people with demons, and helping to get them out, amen. You want to say anything? Sure. Come on up here. Yeah. So, so one little thing I wanted to add to this was when I met Mike at my job, like he said before, like, you know, there was just this darkness versus light battle between us. I mean, you can definitely testify to that. But the interesting thing behind it all was Russ was praying for Mike 20 years before this point, and he had put him down on a prayer map. You met with him a couple times. The interesting thing was while I was at work, I come across Mike, I start to see some of the, the signs of everything, and I had been listening to Russ while I was at work, and in the midst of all of it, I felt compelled to bring Mike to Russ's house, not knowing that there was this connection between the two. So when I look at Mike, I just see the providence of God in Mike, and I just see what a mighty work and what, what powerful, how powerful God can be when his, when his people lift, lift up other people in prayer. We have to be intercessors. So... I, um, blessings. Um, we got a beautiful little baby daughter girl. 
Um, yes, praise God. This is just an enormous thing because when they, when, when Jordan brought Mike to my house and I see this kid, you know, sitting there in my house, um, in the meeting and then Bible study, he's asking these questions. So we go downstairs because I like, can see something's up here. And as he's standing there, I'm looking at him, looking at him, I said, I know you. I met you in that uh, bowling alley, you know, what, 18 years ago or something, and you had that Crowley deck. He's, I still have that Crowley deck. Well, we got that now. That's marked for destruction. So, praise God for that, and we're just very, very grateful for what God does in lives. And I'm telling you, you know, again, we're going to see in the, in the training here, if you get your uh, manuals out, um, the way the enemy works to uh, not, only, uh, not only own us as we're lost, but to um, eventually use us and get us into things. And it just transfers to generations unless there's a breaking through. I want to say again real quick, because somebody came up to me and said, please do this, mention who was behind setting up this conference? Here she is right here again, Rachel. So we wanted to say thank you one more time. Because a year ago, she set one up and she, uh, she, she rented out or borrowed a Methodist church. 2012, oh, 2012, three years ago. Wow, my boy, I'm losing time. You know. um, so we did this in Chicago, we, we, and when we got there, we have a guy that's from there. Where, where's he at? Where's, where's oh, oh, Joe? He's right here. When we got there, we were told that he, they began to have some strange visitors on Sunday morning, and somebody did a ritual with rice and put it around the pulpit prior to the conference. We found out where that was coming from. So on the day of the conference, when we were doing everything, we went um, over to that occult shop, and some of our guys went in. They're all looking at everything, praying over everything, praying against everything, whatever else. Well, that shop eventually closed down. Now, I've been told by Joe, otherwise, they came after him. They came after him to harm him. And, um, you know, the, the, the demons know. I mean, by the way, you understand, you know, the demons know. Sometimes it's like hitting a beehive if, if, if we're not uh, really aware of what we're doing. And the, the demons do know. We're going to see that in here in Scripture, too. Jesus, I know. The demon said, Paul, I know. But who are you? Remember the seven sons of Shiva? And uh, that demon knew. Like the cop here in this area. And his wife brings me in and he manifests. Dizdar, we know you. That was, a, you know, this voice. Uh, and, and literally it said, we have fought you before. That was, you know, I said, well, <laughs> it, you know, because it never hasn't, it's not about you anyway. You know, it doesn't matter. Well, do you know who Jesus is? And, and, and you bring in the authority of Christ over it. And, and they know. They know, they, many of them know, they are, there's already a conceding, but many times they go out screaming and, and crying for what, um, what uh, uh, that authority and power coming down on them. Take a look, if you would, please, at your notes, and we're going to look at page 23, Species and Methods of the Dark Side. Now, I want to go through this fast because I've got two other sections I want to give you. We've got to, you know, we've got to crunch uh, some of this in really quickly here um, because it's really important to know some of this. We are on page 20, what is that, 23? Yeah, 23. The species and methods of the dark side, point number one, fallen angels and demons. Um, now we know, the, you know, primarily reading the gospel of Mark even, um, or any of the gospels, unclean spirits, spirits, demons, um, those kind of things. But I want you to understand that when you think in terms of demons, that they're not just little imps running around on the floor that they are a massive collective, probably hundreds and hundreds of millions of them. We need to understand what the scriptures reveal, not only the origins of it all, the nature of the dark side, where they're utterly bent against God, uh, insatiable lust to uh, take over. Uh, their nature is the utter, utter, utter hatred of Christians, for sure. Uh, and they don't care about humanity other than uh, using and abusing. They have an agenda. But in the, in the structure of the demonic realm, that we talked about the mystery of iniquity, the mysterium, you have different kinds. Um, how many here have dogs? Raise your hand. Anybody have chihuahuas? Anybody have a great name? Oh, wow. Different sizes, right? Okay. My daughter brings home two little uh, Jack Russell Terrier mixes about this big, and they're about this big now, and they're cool. It's Alice and Bella, and uh, we like them, and they're home there. So we get to the new house, and, and she brings home this little tiny thing. It's a miniature, totally black miniature chihuahua. She named him Bean. <laughs> Bean is the coolest dog. I mean, he is the most, I, I'm really, Bean is just a cool little dog. 
A few weeks later, my daughter brings home, she lives in the top apartment of the house like the, she brings home an uh, American bully from the inner city. It concerned me a little bit. He's a this big. Now he's this big. <laughs> Muscular, huge. He is the friendliest, dopiest little thing. I mean, he is the, 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 the coolest dog. Uh, his name's Jax. So there's Jax and Bean, and they sleep together. The, where, you know where they like to sleep? They don't have a little dog thing. They have a suitcase. <laughs> and this big, huge bully sleeps, and Bean sleeps with him. They run together. When he was a little bit littler, Bean was able to, all, because he was just kind of floppy, you know, and knock him over all the time. It's hilarious to watch this thing and that little thing. Uh, some of you have been to the house, seen them. They're both dogs, but they're different in species. Remember Jesus said, this kind comes only out by prayer and fasting, right? Yes. This kind, the word kind, the Greek word type, typos, it means species. This species of the dark side, this type of the dark side. So when you read, mark down Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Be empowered you know, by the mighty strength of God. Put on the full armor of God. So we're commanded in verse 10 to put on the full armor of God. And the result of putting on the full armor of God, you manifest the might, the strength, and the dunamis of God. Who wouldn't want to have the armor on? To be able to have the might and the strength and the power of God manifest and through your life. So that's what it's all about, even the armor of God having on your life, uh, putting it on. Well, how does that happen? Well, you put on the armor of God. We're, we're going to take a look at that. Then we read in that same chapter, for your battle, your struggle is not against flesh and blood. We read it in the English as principalities, powers, and that's fine. But the Spirit of God chose, and I'll give those to you right here, cosmocrater. Your battle is against cosmocraters, arche, exousia, porneus, numenicae. Four different kinds of of the demonic realm. Cosmocrators like the, would be like the ascended master types. Uh, the um, Archon, the Archae would be like the princes over cities and areas and towns and even a nation, rulers. Uh, you have the uh, exousia that ex exude authority over in areas and cities and over people's lives. Then you have porneus pneumonicae, unclean spirits in people and on people and operative. In first, um, uh, Timothy 4.1, you have the Spirit of God saying that planos spirit, these planos types. So they are all demonic and satanic as far as the nature. They're all collectively together, but they're different in their function, different in their size, different in their power and their abilities. Uh, this is how the entire picture biblically of the world is. It's almost like the world is grid mapped. And in the, from the air all the way to the ground, the demonic realm has the whole of the world grid mapped. And they are cosmocrater, they are archon, they are, they are exousia, they are poneus pneumonicae. That's all there in Ephesians 6 and then 1 Timothy 4, 1. They are planos. Planos means imposter. The idea of their function is to seduce, but they're imposters, spirit guides. They're imposters. And, and, and Mike will know all of these kind of workings of spirits and spirit guides and demons and the recognition. You know, when anybody's come out of the deep side of that, they can still remember all of the different kinds of spirits and what they've done and, you know, how they've been lied to. And when they get out, them coming back to say, hey, we want you back or you're ours or they want to do a lot of things like that. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you here. Look down a little bit further. They all have the same nature. You can write it in. This is, this is just a biblical revelation of them. They all have the same nature. They all have the same agenda. And they all have the same Lord or the boss. Satan is Lord of them. He is the God of this age, small g. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Um, they all have to submit to Christ. They all have to and will uh, submit so when the authority of Jesus comes, in the Old Testament they did not have that. So when Jesus is taking the 72 in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, sending them out to unleash the Gospel of the Kingdom, to pray for the healing, and to command demons out, of course the disciples come back just absolutely beside themselves. Wow, the spirits submit to us in your name. Uh, they, were, they were really filled with joy. They were really just, it was astounding. Remember how when Jesus began to cast out demons? And you look at the book of Mark specifically, the people were astounded. 
You know, he gives orders to spirits and they obey him, was what the people were saying. Because that didn't occur. It was in that world, kind of like in witchcraft world, it was, it was spells against spells, bigger demons against littler demons, uh, bigger rituals against smaller rituals. Coven, co- is there coven warfare? You better believe it. But it's all within the same ranks. It's all the same, it's all the same stuff. So when we talk about this, you've got to understand that um, there's, there's, there's just, like in some people, there's going to be very powerful demons, and very, new, you know, 20 of them, 30 of them. In some, there might be two. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about a pastor years ago when he was talking about doing a lot of deliverances. He needed a lot of deliverances. And he said, in dealing with one of the people, he said, and some spirits are really weak and some spirits are less knowledgeable. He said, after we commanded some demons out of an individual, he felt something was there. And so the pastor said, in the name of Jesus, is there anybody else in there? And a voice said, nope. I love to tell that because it is just absolutely hilarious. There are spirits that are like that, much weaker. And sometimes deliverance can be over in 30 seconds. Pastoring a church out here in this area, um, a black minister brings in, uh, we're in with this other white kid and we're sitting there and, and the black pastor is from a certain uh, uh, denomination. He's one of the closest, I mean, he is a friend of, friend of, friend of, he, I had him come and live with me. Uh, his name's Todd. And he just called me the other day from uh, South Carolina where he lives now. And um, we had a great time. He wants to bring us down and do conference among the black churches down there. But we're sitting there and he's like, well, I don't really believe, you know, there's demons like that. That might be true in third world countries and there might be some of that, but it doesn't happen here. And he's going on and on and on. I'm just looking at him smiling at him. Uh, All of a sudden this kid goes, I feel like something wants me to just start screaming and mocking God. Something's over him. Something's want me to mock God. What? And he starts just like, you can see him like he's getting, getting out of control. And so we, I said, sit in this chair. And, and I just, I said a prayer first and just felt the power of the Spirit of God come down. And it's as if, when the moment I said in the name of Jesus, he went, he went completely rigid on the chair and just stretched out. And this violent scream came out and the Spirit left him. You know who was hanging onto the chair rail looking straight at this two feet away? My pastor friend. His theology changed instantly. He saw the authority of Christ, but he saw the reality of the demonic. God set that up, I didn't. And there was no tuition to pay. That's why when we've had folks come to these offices, whether pastors, cops, whoever, just said, no, you're coming to the room. You're going to see this. The, the people that have gotten the scaredest, you know, over the years. Did I tell you this? I told the missionaries this Monday, Tuesday. Over the years, the people that have gotten the scaredest even ran out. Bikers. <laughs> Bikers. They saw a demon manifestation. We were the one, this pastor from Akron calls, and we get to the house, and this lady's on the ground, and one biker has one leg, one biker has another leg, one biker has an arm. I said, don't hurt her. <laughs> don't hurt her. And the pastor's pouring oil all over her head. I'm like, why are you doing that? Why are you pouring oil over her head? Her hair's all soaked in oil. And this, this demon, ah, you know. As soon as that happens, the bikers, three, the bikers all run to the door. One guy goes, I'm not in for this. And that, they went out the door on those Harleys, and they were gone. And all it takes is what Jesus did. In the name of Jesus, stop this. You will not harm her. See, this is how simple it can be. Forget the Roman exorcism baloney. Don't read books to demons. It only gives them time to mess up on other people. Why do a ritual to counter rituals? (laughs) So this Roman exorcism ritual junk is, is so unbelievably wrong. If you don't know the living Christ, you don't know about the authority you have. You don't need a robe. You don't need a candle. You don't need uh, the incense. That, you don't need any of that stuff. You don't have to do war dances. You don't have to, you know, and people say, well, do you have to fast? Sometimes, if you're going to have something ahead of time, right. But 90% of the time, you're going to just, it's going to be in your face. When do you say, don't manifest yet. I've got I've to go spend the day and not eat the whole day. 99% of all the deliverances in the Bible were just on the spot done. There's times when we know someone's coming in, it's going to be a heavy thing. We had a Catholic priest coming in, demonized, and uh, out of Pennsylvania. Um, 
Uh, we did some fasting ahead of time, just to be, just to be spiritually sharp and be sensitive to the Spirit of God and, and to deal with what was in and on in Him, and that was a wild, incredible thing. Um, so I, I just wanted you to understand this issue of the, uh, the species. If you go down a little bit further, they are in the air. Mark down Ephesians chapter 2. The prince of the power, the Greek word, the archon, this ruler of the dominion is the word, exousia, the dominion of the eros, the, the immediate dense atmosphere above our heads. Satan is the ruler of that, that realm around the earth. So right above our heads and right out there, right above us, uh, in the air, Satan is the prince of the power, literally, of the air, the atmosphere. Now, you can read in Ephesians 6, the principalities, the powers, the wicked forces, who are where? Where are they located in Ephesians 6? The cosmocratas, the exousia, these demons, where are they located? In the epihuronos, the heavenlies right above our heads. They work from the top down. They are in the heavenlies, a collective globally that's operative globally. They love to get in people. They love to get them to build temples. They love to have a ground-based doorway opened up. Um, you've got to realize who they are and the extent. They're also on the ground in the sense that uh, they're in people's lives. They're in temples that people make. They're in amulets. They're in things, ritual sites. So they're on the ground in that sense too. But they have to have a ground base. They've got to have the laws of engagement. They've got to be there um, from some level of open door. They're also in a person. Uh, just think of Mark chapter 5. No question about that. Look at this guy totally, totally taken over in Mark chapter 5. So they're in a person. They can be in a group. And the best way to study this is the Old Testament tribes. A demon can get into a grandmother or grandfather. And they truly welcome it and everything else. They have children. Whether they even know it, the demonic called in the Old Testament familiar spirit, they, by um, just the sense of rights, want to say, well, we, we go to the next part of this generation. We want your kids. And, we, and they want the next generation. They want the next generation. So anybody that has parents that have been in any kind of secret society, any kind of cult group, witchcraft, Satanism, opening doors, if you have parents and grandparents above you that have opened the doors, uh, it has nothing to do with you. The demons are going to claim the littlest rights they can get to say, we're going to keep coming down, coming down, coming down, and we're going to get access to your kids. It doesn't mean you're going to be auto, you know, automatically possessed, but it will mean that you'll have more influence than some people because in your family line, doors were opened. People call, some people call that generational, okay, where it came down. Some people are having sleep paralysis because a mom, a dad, a grandfather was into occult witchcraft, they open, they open the doors. The spirits are like, we want a part of this bloodline. We want to be a part of this whole thing. That's true in tribes. Name one tribe in the Old Testament outside of Israel that was not demonized tribe in, in the midst of demon worship. The Perizzites, the Moabites, the Philistines. Keep on going, and you got all the tribes demonized, demon gods, human sacrifice. You read in uh, first, uh, Second Kings chapter uh, 22, 23, Manasseh, he opens the door to the starry host and then to more things and more things. Finally, in the temple, they're making Asherah poles in the temple of God. Then he takes his own son to Tobiath and he lays him on a slab and sacrifices his own son to Moloch, throwing him into a pan alive to only burn the child to death, to melt the child. How do you get convinced as a mom and a dad that's what you're supposed to do? Child human sacrifice. Talking about generation, now you're going to open up a big door here. Discussion. Where did the Benai Elohim come down? in the beginning, prior to Genesis 6, to engage humanity to create Nephilim. Where did all the Nephilim tribes hang out? Where was the worst of the worst of demonic demons and gods and Moloch and all that? What region? Where there's the most volatility right now? Where were the temples, the charged objects, the places? 
It all centers in one place. And with the knowledge of the dark side that Christ is returning where? In the visible return, where is he returning? Who wants to circle that? Who wants to stop that? Who wants to keep the gateway shut? Who wants to... You got to understand how clear they understand prophecy and they seek to um, either get rid of the recipients or stop the fulfillment. Revelation 12 says the dragon was there to devour the Christ child. How did he know? How did he know to be there? He targeted the Christ child, but it says the Christ child is snatched away, right? Re Revelation 12. Harpezo. That's the word used in, in Thessalonians, when the dead in Christ shall rise, we who are alive shall harpezo. We call it Latin rapture, harpezo, the catching up of the saints. That's what happened in the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus. But Satan targeted him. He wanted to devour, to swallow whole, to completely devour the Christ child. Revelation 19.19, 19, mark it down. It's future. It's Armageddon. Here's what it says. The beast and his armies, well, they go out on the field to fight. The Antichrist makes it, and his armies make it. And they raise their weapons to, bat, to make war on the rider of the white horse. How does he know to be on the field that day? How many years does it take to build the army, to build the weaponry, to do the stuff, and then eventually gather there, knowing that the ultimate... You know, the ultimate goal isn't to get to the temple to say, I'm God. That's not the ultimate goal here. The ultimate goal of the end of days is Armageddon, so Satan can use the masses of humanity, altered, demonized, with every possible technology to raise its weaponry. He has to stop Jesus Christ. What happens in Revelation 20? One angel is sent, grabs Satan, binds him with a chain for a thousand years. He's sent to the abyss. That is coming. And they know it. So in Revelation 12, when it says Satan, filled with wrath, because he knows his time is short. It's based on the coming of Christ. If anything, all of hell fears the coming of Christ because it's the end of their reign. They know it. The scriptures are, are so advanced, so precise. Amen. So if you want to know what's happening, and if you want to explain to the rest of the world, and tell them well, this is what's happening, and this is what's going on, this is what's going on, you got to do like they did in the book of Accident. Then make a beeline straight to the cross. Here is the hope of hope. Here is the hero of humanity. Here is the savior of the world. Here is the de deliverer. Here is the one that gives you the indestructible immortality. Here is the savior. Hallelujah, world, there's a Savior over against everything else that's going on. So that's got to be proclaimed. And please understand, I don't care, as we've been talking about the suppression of the church and everything else, remember the gospel, never back down from this, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1, 1.16, right? In the face of all of Rome and the blood cults and the emperor worship, Paul's heading in, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Among all the Pax Roma and all of the educated universities and all of the stuff with Rome, the empire, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Don't ever be ashamed. I don't care if it's professors. I don't care if it's physicists. It make, doesn't make any difference. Because inside of them is a sin nature, a lost nature, and the power of the gospel can confront them. And when you share the gospel, God's going to speak to them. God's going to summon them. You could be here today lost. You've been dragged here. Praise God for the person that dragged you here. Uh, I buy them a lunch, uh, you know, um, because they love you and you're lost. And if you go out of here today lost, you're dead. You're lost. You're, you're, that's the end of your life. The Bible says they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. You could have been, should have been. God wants you and nobody wants you more. Name somebody that wants you more than God does. Who else came to die on a cross and take your place, become the sin bearer? He literally bore your sins on the cross. And you proclaim that in the resurrection. You have power of the Holy Spirit that's going to witness to people's lives. It's huge. Let me give you a factor here. We can turn the page. Um, uh, and, and, and we're going to talk about some of the other places demons begin to travel into top of that page in a family line. And this is where, when you're thinking about this, when we come to the freedom encounter part of this, 
you got to think in terms of, you know, you know what? I just, over the years, when I first got saved coming out of Buddhism, um, going to a temple and all this stuff for years, when I got saved, nobody told me. I, got, I had the Cornelius kind of experience of just saved and so inundated, so filled with the Spirit of God. You know, I, I went out just unleashing the gospel on my family, everybody, any person, didn't make any difference. I hitchhiked just so I could witness to the guy that would pick me up. I don't want to lose that. Be I want to be as aggressive as I was then. I did, um, because um, well, in that time though, uh, nobody even told me uh, the spirit of God. I mean, I knew, and so all I knew was to go down in the basement, take the things off the wall, collect everything. Everything that I knew was of the dark side. Was doorways, all any and all. The, I didn't care about it any longer. All of the music, anything and everything. My friends later yelled at me, oh, you should have gave it to me. Here's what I said to them. Why? Because the same Satan would use your life and then lead you to hell. And then I preached the gospel to them. They either stayed around or they got out of there. <laughs> it was one or the other. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. You will love your friends better if you go ahead and tell them about Jesus and tell them truly. And I love you and this is the gospel. Because that's what happened to me in a party that I was at not too far from here in 1975. The week before I tried to commit suicide in an occultic experience. A week later, because of the prayers of some girl seeing my face in a yearbook, began to put up prayers for me. God intervened, sent one man into a party where everybody's doing acid and drugs, 45 people. And this guy leveled the party, cleared the house, preached the gospel, that one, that one, that one, it just walked in and unleashed the gospel to everybody, and I hid from him on the back porch, and he got to me. I'm not going to tell you the story again. I think I've told this before now, but, but uh, when he got to me, I was hiding in the dark. He unleashed the gospel on me. It's the first time in my life as a 19-year-old I ever heard the gospel like that. And when I left him that night, I left my apartment and drove home 20 miles to my mom and dad's house, said, I'm, I'm going to stay there and get away from this guy. Laid my head down. And I didn't know who the Holy Spirit was, but he was there. Total conviction. Three hours of battling this issue. Thinking of Jesus and all that he said, and thinking about where I was, and back and forth and back and forth. I even pounded my head once and said, God, get out of my head. I'm sleepy. I'm tired. <laughs> it says it got, got, like got no deal. Conviction, convincing, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And I rolled out of the bed just a few miles from here uh, in that apartment, and I just said, Jesus, this little old hippie kid trying to be a Buddhist bar fighting dummy, got out of bed and said, Jesus, forgive me. I don't know everything about you. I know you're God, your Savior. I acknowledge that. Come into my life. They said you'll give me your power. You will change my life. I renounce everything I've ever been into. I don't care what any of my friends say. I don't care what anybody says. I just want you, and I turn my life over to you. I give you my life. That was in 1975 uh, in September. Jesus came in and flooded my being and led me then to just oust everything that needed to get out. Not always do believers that get saved, do they get rid of everything. And that's important. In your family line, there may be, you know, Masons or Rashikrushans or secret societies or cult groups or whatever, and the demons think they have a right to come to you. In a tribe, that is true. Any of the tribes of the Old Testament, it's all handed down. Anybody in witchcraft knows that witchcraft can go from grandmother to mother to daughter and down the road. In a city, the demonic realm loves to take up uh, residence in a city and make the area dark. Uh, that's true in the Old Testament, too, where they oversee a city area, a nation. Book of Daniel, the Prince of Persia, right? How about uh, charged writings? All of those writings that when spirit guides guide people to write, become they are the dake demonoia. Not just writings of occult, outright occult writings, but what about fantasy writing, where a spirit guide is in a man, and he writes Slender Man series. That's, if, if he has a spirit guide, and I believe he does, he's out of Erie, Pennsylvania, I believe that it then inspires the fantasy writings that infected the little 12 and 13 year old girl to believe that this entity was real and they wanted to commit um, a sacrifice so that Slender Man would come and get them and take, him, take them to a castle in the woods. So they talked their little friend, 12 year old, into the woods and they stabbed her and they stabbed her and they tried to kill her and commit a ritual sacrifice to Slender Man. The little poor girl that got stabbed didn't die all the way. She crawled out of the woods and they found her. Obviously, her physical side is healing up. The two girls that went to a juvie in prison and whatever, the psychiatrist just lately said the one particular girl was asked the question, do you still believe Slender, Slender Man's alive? Yes. 
Would you do anything he said? Yes, if he told me to kill somebody, I would do what Slenderman told me to do. The very picture of Slenderman, in my opinion, is a, a crude picture of the actual demon spirit guide in the man that writes the fantasy writings. That's true of um, guild wars in the gaming industry. Necromancers, sorcerers, maguses, spells, summoning of demons, using charms, straight out of some of the darkest occult level works. A lot of gaming has a lot of occult oriented works that can be charged. Music, it's not just the guys on the stage and their way they look and they're painted and everything else. Do lyric analysis. Just as a demon can take and inspire in a person to write occult writings, to write fantasy writings, a demon inside a person can lead and inspire and write lyrics to songs that are charged, that played with the music can bring inspiration, create doorways. When I was a police chaplain in Akron, um, they would take me to the Jar Arena purposely when Slayer, Typo Negative, and Marilyn Manson came in, they'd bring me to the back. They would literally want to shove me into them because they wanted me to do a deliver. They wanted something to happen. Marilyn Manson, uh, four times on stage, went total possessed. When he came off the stage and they brought him around, they wanted me to pray over him and engage him. He was on the floor, sweaty with a thong on. I didn't want to touch him. Good, you don't have to touch demonized people. It was messy. He was growling and they dragged him off into the back. I didn't get to do anything. I met Peter Steele from Typo Negative deep in the occult. When Slayer came, if you remember the South of Heaven album, there's a song called Spill the Blood. Read the lyrics. Do lyric analysis. It is a ritual uh, leading uh, kids or anybody else into summoning. You, you've got to understand that across the board, uh, in the area of music and specifically now with many of the popular people out there, you know, some of it's maybe for show, the Illuminati symbolism and all the rest of it, but some of it's real stuff and some of the uh, Nicki Minaj, you know, you look at some of the ritual things that are being poured out there, they're just really horrific and uh, they, they help open doorways. There's more to the lyrics and more to uh, a musician than, than I think we think. <laughs> Harry Potter. He's just a nice guy. Right? He said, it's a nice, right? Isn't it all nice? We went to Hudson when they had the Harry Potter, Harry Potter uh, party out there with thousands of people and the light streams. We, we were there, four of us, in the midst of this massive crowd of Harry Potter lookalikes, and they're all dressing up like it, and we were out there, and we're out there praying against because they're going to do this light show, and they're gonna, all going to say this stuff to kind of like, almost like summoning to open a doorway. Yeah. We prayed against it. What happened? Who's, who was with me then? Was it? I thought it was one of our guys that was with us. Uh, the machinery broke down. They couldn't do it. I don't know. Maybe it was. But I'm like, we're there. There's four of us. There's thousands of others. Um, I saw so many Harry Potters. Well, two things. The lady is guided by inspiration to write the books. Whose inspiration? Notice that God has been erased. It's not just a, you know, opposition to God. God has been sucked out of the Harry Potter writings. Where do you find God anywhere in the Harry Potter writings or movies? It's magic, magic, magic against magic, dark magic, it's all magic. To give this confusion, as Mike said, well, some of it's good and some of it's bad. Some of it's white magic, some of it's dark magic. Lie. Right? So I believe it, on the one side, desensitizes kids. On the other side, it puts in the fantasy, the ideas, they can have a wand in power. Uh, it, has, it, it, it points them only to dark side magic, left-hand path magic, in a polite Harry Potter kind of way. Satan comes, meta schizmazatai, masquerades as an angel. Who wouldn't want an angel of light? A cool angel of light. Test the spirits to see whether of God or not. First John 4, right? Charged writings, uh, there's just, I would say, thousands of books now worldwide. You can see it on Amazon, see it at local bookstores and the sections on the cult. Thousands of books that are charged writings now. Charged objects, did you hear Mike talk about that? 
One girl came into a church like this, the Orange Church we were at years ago over in Ellet. Came down the aisle, I saw her sit right there, an invitation, she just stood there like a zombie, and I went up, and I looked at her, and I said, didn't they want you to come forward? They don't want you to be here? So I said, in the name of Jesus, and that's as far as I got, and she was thrown between the pews onto the ground. Everybody was around, sir, they heard the demon speak out. She was delivered in a few moments, but it wasn't finished. She was brought back the next week, and over by the wall, they'd call me over there. We're in the middle of worship. So we began to pray for her, and the moment we said, in the name of Jesus, literally, everybody saw this. She was thrown against the wall, and she went down to the ground. She was delivered. The demons came out, went to her house, said, let's get all the occult objects, all of the witchcraft stuff, two, actually more than two, full garbage bags full of objects, occult books, workings, ritual things. They all went to the fires. Well, we tell people, I think, I think we need to get rid of any of those things because you can't sanitize charged objects per se. I do believe you can, you can command a demon off a charged object. We, we've had that happen. But. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, they put it in the garbage things, we took it out to the, and we burned it all. We burned it all. I mean, I don't know where else to do it. Josiah did it by grinding it all down to powders and grinding it and putting it in a latrine so nobody can get it right. So you're right, somebody could get it out. And don't realize, you've got to realize something. Demons who are in temples, demons who are in old temple buried archaeological sites, demon objects that have demons on them, they know how to summon people to the sites. They know how to draw people. They know <laughs> satanic synchronicity and to bring people to come and find. And so there's this whole supernatural side. You know, I have an archaeologist that contacted us and said, Russ, we're getting ready to enter a site on the border of Mexico. It's very similar to Chechen Itza. We're going to find a lot of stuff. And of course, they are looking for objects to sell and make money, of course, too, right? But we've listened to what you've been saying, and we're worried now and going in. Could it be that some of these objects are demonized? Well, if they worship demon gods, assume so. It's like all the Greek temples and all the Greek places and Diana, all the rest, assume so. Nashville built a replica of the Parthenon, right? Anybody been there? It, you remember walking through the great big doors and looking up at her like a Nephilim? Notice the things that were around her and the little demon things and power things that were all over her whole being? They build, a, they build a massive temple to a Nephilim entity that, that covers itself and other demons to keep charged up and powered up. And so Nashville, somebody built a replica of that. Something that God in the flood was to wipe out all those places everywhere. Those places on a global scale. You know, you know how far the Nephilim got in the development of those, those Nephilim architecture sites? They got everywhere. And so in the, in the flood, in the burying of all of this, problem is people are beginning to dig it up, get light, led, get guided. Some people are using occult objects. The NRB, the, 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 the Nazi group, they were using occult means to find occult objects, charged objects. Hitler was trying to gain all the charged objects they could for power. And uh, that, that is extremely dangerous. In Akron, the, the defense attorney, Larry Whitney, calls me into a case that happened in Highland Square. Brett Hartman was caught. Um, the girl, Winda Snipes, stabbed 130-some times, jab, 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 sexually used, abused, killed the night before what's called in September the hands of glory ritual, to seek the powers of invisibility. Her hands were cut off. They're, they're, they're used with herbs and put under the ground, and when they're petrified, they're brought out to be put on an altar to have charged human hands of power. Akron police have never found it. They engaged us in it, and uh, the Larry Whitney, the defense attorney, said, Russ, um, Pastor Russ, as soon as I walked in his office, this has never happened before, do you believe in Satan? <laughs> and I said, yeah, he's real. He goes, I, know, I believe he's real now, too, and he showed me some of the pictures. Uh, so a girl that died in a bloody ritual uh, on the night before, or the, or the night of, hands of glory, I even called Howie Chizik. WHLO or WNIR, when they brought up the story online, and I said, I called and I said, Howie, check, check it out. 
They checked it out and they called Akron police. They said, yeah, they didn't want, they wanted to, here's what happens in law enforcement in the academies. Talk about the crime, bury the information about Satanism. Don't tell any of the public because it creates a panic. I disagree. I disagree. We can give you a number of cases. Mike began to talk about knowing Dan Cooper, whose child, Jackie Cooper, in Akron, was taken to Stairway Coven, and then Mike Duffield, remember she was stabbed 40-some times in her feet? Remember the, tat the, uh, the occult symbols, tat not tattooed, but, but put in with needles in the side of her head? Jackie Cooper and her sister, Lelani were in my vehicle. I met Dan. We tried to get, we took them to church. Lelani and Jackie was in our church. I went over to pray for them. I was concerned. We were trying to get Dan to surrender everything to Jesus at the time and the girl, the mother, to, to surrender. I went looking for them because we, we lost them at one point. And um, the, wife, the woman introduced me to some guy named Dan and uh, we offer, I said, listen, we'll take the girls. If you want us to take the girls, we'll take the girls. If you want us to, uh, we'll get you an apartment. We'll get you everything you want. Take this number. Call me tomorrow. We'll help you in every way. Well, she disappeared for four or five months. I was so bugged. I went looking for her. Didn't find her in any place. On the way home on WNIR, the announcement, uh, Jackie Cooper has been killed. And a man, Dan Duffield, has been charged in the newspapers here. He proclaimed himself to be a Crowlinian, a black pagan. In numerous rituals over her, with many broken bones in this little body, uh, he, he ritually, they ritually used her and abused her and killed her. Now, they didn't go down as a marking. I mean, it said in the paper, but they, you know, they just dealt with the death and the guy's in prison. The mother was in prison 11 years, and she is out now. And the father just called me asking for help to get out of the dark side just two weeks ago. And Mike knows the same guy and knows the background of the occultism here in Akron, Ohio. Uh, little Jackie Cooper, cult killing. Charge writings, charge objects, ritual sites. There's ritual sites here in Ohio. There's ritual sites that we've been to to dig up bones and things like that. Ancient Nephilim architecture, Chechen Itza. Um, all